بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون يا أيها الذين آمنوا هل أدلكم على تجارة تنجيكم من عذاب أليم تؤمنون بالله ورسوله وتجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالكم وأنفسكم ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ذلك الفوز العظيم وأخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين Jazakallah al-Khair, Brother Shirazi, for uh, this introduction. And I would like to thank Northeastern Illinois University and also thank the MSA for uh, actually hosting this event, uh, an important event that's... Thank you. An important event uh, that actually covers uh, the first hot issue, which is about the economy. And the second one is uh, we're going to talk about Syria. And Syria is uh, actually a topic that's keeping the whole world awake. Since the start of the revolution, the start of the revolution, and the whole world is awake and watching and planning for Syria. Watching what's going to happen in Syria. Watching where the Syrian revolution is going. Uh, they watched other Arab revolutions, but it was quick, fast, get it done fast, and that's it. They put it in the direction they want. But the Syrian revolution, it's still they are struggling with it. They couldn't find a way how to deal with it. So the whole world is up, whether it's the West, the US, uh, Europe, uh, Russia, China, uh, the Arab world, the Arab governments, all of them, they're watching the Syrian revolution, they're watching what's going on there, and they try to determine the outcome of the revolution. In this talk, this will be my discussion. I'll be going through some historical, so the, uh, some historical uh, overview, which is the Syrian revolution, why, why did it happen, and then the revolution timeline, I'll be going quickly, so I, would, I will not leave you here for a long time, because if I want to go through a two years of revolution, it will take two years, but I'll try to make it quick. Then we'll go over the, uh, the world perspective, which is how the world is viewing the Syrian revolution, and then the Islamic perspective, looking at the Syrian revolution, and then concluding with what should be the future direction. How is the future direction of the Syrian revolution? So we'll start, inshallah, so the uh, Syria, which is what the brother uh, Muhammad just mentioned. It's called Asham. And Asham was part, Asham was part of the Islamic State, the Islamic Khilafah, for 1300 years. And before that, it was occupied and was under the rules of the uh, Romans. And under the Khilafah, this is the uh, Khilafah map. This is where the uh, whole Islam spread for 1300 years. So this was the map of the Islamic State. You go from Mecca to Damascus, you go to uh, which is now Turkey, you go to Istanbul, you go to Spain, you don't need a passport. You don't need anything like that. You just ride the camel, whatever transportation you have, and you go. That's it. Then 
the world start at that time the powers start planning for the destruction of Islam, the destruction of the Khilafah. And that's what they did. The Ottoman Empire at the end, or the Ottoman Khilafah at the end, it was weak. And you have France and Britain, they are two strong powers at that time. The Ottoman Khilafah was weak. So they destroyed the system of Khilafah, destroyed Islam. And through the Sykes Pico, which is Sykes and Pico, these are the two uh, prime foreign ministers of the uh, France and Britain. They, in 1918, they, they met and they divided the Muslim land. The whole Ottoman Khilafah, the whole large Khilafah that we saw, now they have to control it. Two powers. They have to share it among them. It's their benefit. So they sat each other on a table, they have the pen, and they start drawing. Okay, let's create. This is Syria. This is Jordan. This is Egypt. This is Palestine. This is then they translated, or they created all of these borders. Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Libya. Before that, you didn't have all of these borders. Now, all of they created all of these countries. And one of them is Syria, which we'll be talking about and we'll concentrate on. And Syria was occupied by the French. Now, going quickly in the history of Syria, after the Syria get its lib liberated from France, there were many governments or many rulers and went through a lot of political change in Syria. So the first coup that took place actually was in 1949. And that was uh, led by Husni al-Za'im. And actually it was supported by the CIA. So if you go to Wikipedia and just look at this revolution and this coup, who supported this coup, you'll find it was led by the CIA. And you will have the name of the CIA agent there, so that's the link there who is interested. We can share the link with you and give you all the details after this. So Hosni Zaim in 1949, it was the first coup. Then if you look in the same year, there are three changes in the, in the, uh, in the leadership. Other years, look, within, from 49 to 61, there is like a 21 years, uh, so 12 years. Look how many actually rules have been changed, rulers were changed. And then in 1963, that's where the Ba'ath uh, regime started and there was the coup by al -Atasi. And then it followed by the Ba'ath uh, ruling. And in 1970, uh, there was the, uh, the coup by Hafez al-Assad. And uh, Ahmed al-Khatib was appointed as a civil uh, leader for four months. And after that, Hafez al-Assad took over as the military leader of Syria and the president of Syria until he died. And in, and in uh, 2000, uh, Bashar al-Assad came into power. So in Syria, before when Syria started, there was the, it's a Muslims. The people are Muslims living there. So when the system started and the government started, there is start, there is people who live in Islam. So there were Islamic movements there who are actually uh, opposing the system. And I'm just going to go and list just two uh, major movements there on parties. One of them is the Muslim Brotherhood. And this was established in 1930s in the mid, or mid 1940s in, in Syria. Uh, its current leader is Muhammad Riyad al Shaqfa, and it's part of the opposition. Uh, pre-1963, and it was banned by the Ba'athi government uh, in 1963, and was crushed by al-Assad uh, regime in Hama in 1983, or about almost the minimum number that says about in Hama massacre, there was about 30,000 they were killed just in Hama massacre. The second major group that's working there is, that's in, in Syria, is Hizb al-Tahrir. And that was established in 1953, and its current leader is Ata Abu Rashta, and it's banned since its establishment because its objective is establishing the rules of Islam. It's not working with the government, it's toppling the government. In 1998, 1999, the Syrian authorities arrested hundreds of members in the nation, nationwide my hunt by the Air Force Intelligence. So these are the two major, actually, uh, groups that were present in the Syria, in the Syrian land. Now, the uh, Syria by itself, it's not disconnected from the West. So Hafez al-Assad was ordered, we know that 
the Golan Heights uh, uh, fall in the hands of the uh, occupiers, which is the, the Yehud, the Israelis. And it was actually, there was no fight there. Hafez al-Assad ordered the, his, his, his army to withdraw. So that's the first sign of the connection that he is against the, even the Syrian people the, themselves. Then the second thing is the Syria participates in the US-led multinational coalition against Iraq. So that's the US and the West. Uh, they had a coalition against Iraq in 1991. So Syria was part of that. So that's another link where the US and Syria, they're actually working together. Third link is when Hafez al-Assad passed away, died. Then Madeleine Albright, two days after that, she said that Bashar should take on the mantle, which means that Bashar should be the one who should be ruling next, two days after that. And that's what happened. Hosni Mubarak, you know, he started complaining about this, and within one day he changed his mind, and he also supported that Bashar al-Assad should be the one, uh, the one who should be ruling uh, uh, Syria. So these are the links where the United States can say, okay, we want that ruler in this country in Syria, and that was Bashar al-Assad, and that they got what, what they want. At the time of George W. Bush, the U.S. Secretary uh, uh, orchestrated talks between Syria and Israel to resolve the issue of Golan Heights. It's an occupied land. So there was these serial, these talks, which are uh, sort of by, this, by, by the United States. So the United States has a role and a played role in that, which has its connection with uh, Syria. And we all know the recent, from recent history in the last 10 years, the Baker Hamilton report about the Syria role in actually uh, getting the United States out of Iraq, how the Syria plays and should play uh, an important role uh, for the U.S. to withdraw from, from Iraq. So the relationship between the U.S. and Syria, it's from these events you say they have a good relationship. There is a cooperation. Yes, but from, from if you look at the, at the, at the media, well, they say they're, they're their enemies, but under the scene, this is what's happening. These are the pictures of Hafez al-Assad with the presidents of the U.S. sitting with them. Okay, who is the enemy? There is no enemy. They're friends. The Syrian revolution, how the Syrian revolution started. Before the Syrian revolution, there was the Arab revolution. The revolutions in, the revolution in Tunisia, which started the whole Arab revolution, then in Egypt, then in Libya, then in Yemen, then in Jordan, and later on it started the revolution in Syria. So the revolution in Syria is not uh, you know, a standalone one by its own. No, it's a continuation of the Arab revolution. It's a continuation of it, so it's not an isolated revolution by itself. But there are lessons learned in that revolution which we'll be talking about. So this is just the statistics on the revolutions in the, in the Arab world, in the Arab countries, when it started, and if it stopped, when it stopped, how many were killed. So if you see the whole, most of the Arab countries, there are revolutions there that are going. Uh, some is finished with, whether you call it successful or unsuccessful, uh, result, but some finished, some is still going on, and some already stopped, and the government tried to, uh, was able to control it. So the Syrian revolution is not an isolated by itself. So the revolution, why it started? One of the things and the reason why the revolution started is economical. Uh, Dr. Malkawi touched on the economy and how the economy situation should be moving the people. So the situation in Syria economy, it's very bad economy there. That in 2000, the United Nations in 2005 announced that there are 30% of the Syrian population are poor. Political oppression. The political parties are not allowed, as we saw. They were some crushed and banned, and they are hunting anyone who talks and speaks against the system. Social corruption, imposing non-Islamic values on the population. Even there are, if you go to the history of Hafez al-Assad, they were trying even to have the Muslims there, the Muslim women not wearing the hijab. And they attempted to do that in Syria, but, they were, but that backfired on them. So they have an attempt to do that, to prevent Muslim women from wearing a hijab. So they are fighting Islam in there, within Syria. A humiliation, that's part of you know, being ruled by the Arab rulers, which is, they have an occupied land which is the Golan Heights. And for many years, many years, Syria did not do anything about it, nothing. Multiple Syrian, multiple Israeli airstrikes on Damascus, on the capital, 
on the home, on the surrounding of the Bashar or Hafez al-Assad. Nothing was done. We have the right, that was the statement, we have the right to respond at our own time. We will choose the time to respond. Nothing else. So the people, the Syrian people are watching this and they keep in mind that, okay, this is their land, that this is their, their, their country. So that's a humiliation by itself when you're attacked in your land and there is no response, nothing. And the last thing from humiliation, which is not standing to defend the honor of the most loved person who was created on the earth, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the people, all the Muslims were moved with what happened to the Prophet, with the cartoons, with the, uh, uh, in the newspapers about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But those rulers did not do anything about it. Did not attempt to do anything. Nothing. So that's within the people created, you know, there's disconnect between them and the, and the governments. So that's, all of these factors are actually pushing for the revolution. And then, Dara came students in the school who were watching, in the school, watching the Arab revolutions, watching in Tunisia, in Egypt, and they wrote on the wall, Yasqut Bashar, Bashar shall fall. And that's it. And Bashar brutally, Brutally, they took these children and they brutally treated them. So their parents, they are their kids, nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old kids. My kids here and there, they were brutal by the system, treated by the government. So the people, they have to stand up for that. So how did it start? How this revolution? Was it planned by the enemies of Syria, US and Israel? As we saw, U.S. and Israel are not the enemies of Syria. Golan Heights was occupied for many years and nothing was done. Air strikes were by, by Israel on Damascus, nothing was done. The U.S. relationship with, this, with Syria is very good. So who's the enemy? There is no enemy. So it started by, Syria, by, the, by the enemies? No. Was it a planned part of the new Middle, Middle East, which is the American plan? It wasn't. And the reason for that is the United States cannot afford a third war. It cannot. It's already having a hard time in Iraq, having a hard time in Afghanistan, and controlling other areas in the world, so it cannot afford at the same time to go into a war in another place. In addition to all the economical crises that we hear, we live here and we see, they cannot go and afford that. Then, is it part of the Arab Revolution? Yes. It's part of the Arab Revolution. It's a continuation of the Arab Revolution. And add to it the Islamic factor. And Islam as ideology by itself, when you understand in Islam as ideology, it moves you. Because it's, you look at the poverty, the issues that we talked about, what moved this uh, revolution, the poverty, humiliation. And once you understand Islam, will, that will move you. And if you look over the history, all over the history of the Arab, the Arab, they were in Jahiliyyah. Then Islam came and draws them. And then when the Islam went away as a ruling system that applied with them, they went down. So the Arab, the Arab themselves, they rise. They rose by Islam and they fall when Islam wasn't there. So they will rise again when Islam rises back. And in the last 30 years, if you see, Islam is coming back. Yes, it's, a, it's not coming back as a ruling system right now, but it's coming back within the people, they're fully understanding it. And once you understand it, you establish that you start your base of thinking, then you start rising. And that was the revolution in Syria. The goals of the revolution. There has to be a goal for the revolution. The revolution in Tunisia was to get rid of Bin Ali. That's it. The, in, in, uh, in Egypt, to get rid of Mubarak. In Libya, to get rid of, to get rid of Al-Qaddafi. In Yemen, to get rid of, of uh, Ali bin Saleh. But is that, is that a change? And we saw in all of these revolutions, what's the end? So look at Libya's situation. Look at the situation in Egypt. Look at the situation in Tunis. Look at the situation in Yemen. It's not stable, because they are looking at changing, changed one person. But Nothing else in that system that actually the cause of the corruption, because the cause of the corruption and the oppression and the humiliation itself is not Mubarak himself. 
It's not Bin Ali himself. It's not Bashar al-Assad himself. No, it's a system. It's a complete system. So for that, it has to be changed. But unfortunately, in the previous Arab revolutions, this was not the goal. The goal was that person, I don't want him. I want him down. I want to put another one. What's after that? I don't know. Is he going to rule the same way? I don't know. So the revolution in Syria has a goal and has an, it has an objective. And that goal is to revive the Muslims, revive the Muslim Ummah. But initially, it started, some of its symptoms were, you know, we're asking for a freedom. That's how it started. We want our freedom. Then they want to you know, get rid of poverty. They want to eat. They want to be able to eat. They want to be able to drive cars, not even drive cars, have the basic things that Dr. Malkawi talked about in the, in, the, in the economy system of Islam, the basic thing that you need in order to survive. And then ending the oppressive rules. Jails of Syria, they were filled, filled with thousands and thousands of people who were tortured. And some of them, they die in jail. And in Syria, you can go to jail and your family doesn't know anything about you. And you will stay there for 20, 30 years, no one knows. And even you don't dare to go and ask. You don't dare to go and ask the government, where is my son? Where is my brother? Where is my father? You can't, uh, you can't because if you ask, you will be there. And its real goal is the complete revival. That's the real goal of the revolution in Asham. Complete revival in terms of applying a just economic system. And that's in Islam. We talked about it in the first lecture. Just political system, that's the system of Islam, which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Khulafa after him, Abu Bakr, Umar, Ali, Uthman, all implemented. And that was the, that's the right political system because it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just social system, which is again comes from Islam. And it's a complete liberation for mankind. Values, thoughts, anything you think of. It's a complete liber liberation for that. Now the revolution timeline. I'm going to try to go quick. Dar'a in March 2011. That's where the large scale... Uh, uh, demonstration started. The government brutally uh, cracked down. UK comes back, comes and says, okay, Assad is a reformer. And then it changes its mind. And it says, the Assad, the Assad shall, uh, he shall step down. Which was also France. That was a France opinion. Now the US comes and says, Hillary Clinton comes and says, there are deep concerns about what's going on inside Syria. And we are pushing hard for the government of Syria to live up to its own stated commitments to reform. What I do know is that they have an opportunity still to bring about a reform agenda. Nobody believed that Qaddafi would do that. People do believe there is a possible path forward with Syria. So we are going to continue joining with all of our allies to keep pressuring very hard on that. So if you see in these times what I'm just be talking about, the date, what happened, and then quotes from the US, from UK, from Russia, from, these, from the governments, the Western governments. May 2011, Rami Makhlouf comes, let's say these are the, the enemies, who are the enemies of Syria. Rami Makhlouf comes and says, if there, is, if there is no stability in Syria, there is no way there will be stability in Israel. So there will be no stability in Israel. If there is no stability in Syria, there is no stability in Israel. So Syria is there to preserve the stability of Israel. So it's not there as an enemy. June and July, the opposition started to reform. The Free Senior Syrian Army was established. And then the United States comes and says that it will, put, it will be continuous uh, discussion with the, with the people who are representing the, the, uh, the uh, Syrian revolution. August 2011, the uh, Syrian National Council, the SNNC, was formed by Burhan Ghalyun and uh, it was just a group of people who from Syria who are actually lived in, in exile in the, uh, from, uh, from Syria and they are uh, not from, the, from Syria itself so they are a group of people living outside Syria established the SNNC in order to have control and have a say on what's going on in the ground. December 2011 
the Arab League observer mission dispatched to Syria to report to the UN its observations. So now the, uh, the United Nations, the Arab League, start to get involved because they're seeing massacre, so they have to do something about it. So what they, what they did, they sent uh, the Muhammad Ahmad al-Dabi, they, they sent him to Syria uh, to watch what's going on and give a report to the, to the United Nations. And then what he did, then he constantly called for more time and colluded with, uh, and he concluded that Hams was not under attack. So even he was on Hams and seeing the attacks, then he reports back there are no attacks there. And he continuously was asking for time to, uh, to continue his mission in order to prolong the, uh, the, uh, the revolution. April 2012, the UN resolution vetoed by Russia. Uh, so now there's, there is the Russian rule here comes where it tries to block the United Nations from uh, any resolution against Syria in order to prolong the revolution as we can see from the uh, quotes here. The resolution condemned the Syrian leadership with vague prospects of intervention. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister said, Russia was not going to accept any resolutions that might open the way for foreign intervention or that would predetermine the political outcome in Syria. Then Richard Gown, an analyst in the New York University Center of International Cooperation said, and to some extent, the high profile diplomatic clashes with the Russians let the Americans look tough and, act, and active, but without them actually having to invest militarily. In a sense, uh, uh, in a sense the, the angry diplomacy of the Security Council has been an alibi for military inaction in Syria. May 2012, UN, uh, Kofi Annan led ceasefire. There were six points he discussed and came to agreement, six points with Bashar al-Assad, but none of them, none of these points call for uh, the, the step down of Bashar al-Assad. The Philip uh, Grovich, a US author and journalist, uh, outlined this initiative. He says, in real life, the UN has effectively run cover for the Syrian regime's bloody campaign by deploying Kofi Annan. The weak and accommodating former Secretary General to Damascus, the peace plan Annan cooked up with Assad in late March, is another soap bubble. And the UN military observers who are supposed to monitor it are useless, or worse. When the butchery began in Hola, the regime told the UN monitors to stay away, which they did. Bringing back bad memories from the mid-90s of the false promises of protection that were extended under the UN flag to people of Bosnia and Rwanda before they were abandoned to their killers. So the United Nations did the same thing in Syria that it did in Bosnia and Rwanda. May 2012, proposal for applying the Yemen model to Syria. So we'll have a transitional government, we'll have uh, the Bashar al-Assad step down and have someone from the government to be appointed as the president. That did not go through. July 2012, bombing of the National Security Headquarters in Damascus. That, when the world saw this, they said, okay, now we have to act. The bombing, this bombing in the security headquarters in Syria killed the main figures and the main planners of the revolution in Syria. They're actually the ones who are killing the people. So we're getting to the top of the system, to getting to the top leaders in Syria. When the world watched this, they said, that's it, enough. Looks like the revolutionists, and the, they are, they are, they're strong now. They can hit in Damascus. This means that Bashar days are counting down. They're now, let's start and do our planning. Then, at this point, for more than a year, the US called for reforms. And when the opposition showed they were capable of removing the regime, the U.S. began calling for intervention. August 2012, U.S. attempts to build alternative lawyer opposition separate to the Syrian people fighting in the country. So in order to, they saw the, SN, the SNC, which is the, uh, the Syrian National uh, Council, is not effective. It's not able to get its hands and control the revolution inside. So the U.S. wants to actually get a representation from the people who are actually fighting, the, people, the fighters in Syria, it wants to get representation. So they start recruiting people from inside. They start getting them out of Syria, interviewing them, whether it's in Jordan, and whether it's in, in, uh, in, in Turkey, and Lebanon, they start testing them. Will be up to that job or not? And their job is to be at the side 
to, in order to, uh, to be controlling the revolution inside Syria and direct it in the direction that the world wants, not the direction that the Syrian people and the Muslims want. November 2012, opposition groups began launching attacks on Damascus, amongst their many other gains. They start getting air base, capturing air bases. November 2012, the Syrian National Coalition was established, which is led by uh, Muad al-Khatib. Now, this is, this is important. If you look for this quote from uh, Hillary Clinton, what she says, we have made it clear. So she is setting rules. We have made it clear that the SNC, which is the Syrian National Council, not coalition, council, can no longer be viewed as the visible leader of the opposition. This cannot be an opposition represented by people who have many, many good attributes, but have in many instances not been in Syria for 20, 30, 40 years. There has to be a representation of those who are on the front lines fighting and dying today to obtain their freedom. So the, the SNC has to be changed and they have to establish a new SNC, a new coalition. Obama said, at this point, after the uh, Syrian National Coalition was established, he said, at this point, we have a well-organized opposition coalition that's representative, that we can recognize them as the legitimate representatives of the Syrian people. So we made them, and we agree that they are the ones who are going to represent the Syrian people. U.S. and EU officials confirmed the United States and the like-minded governments are rushing to fund and legitimize a newly formed Syrian opposition group amid fear that plans for a political transition are being outpaced by rebel military gains. That's the fear. The military gains, the rebels, they might gain the upper hand before what the world is actually cooking for Syria, before finding an alternative for Bashar. December 2012, U.S. placed Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a Nusra front, on the international terrorist list. And this is an important thing uh, that happens, actually, a uh, step where the United States will use it at one point, if needed, because there is a, ter a terrorist group that's inside Syria that has to be taken care of at one point. So it allowed the United States or the whole world to get a resolution from the U.N. that there is a terrorist group there that we have to get in. So that's just a backup plan in the back pocket. U.S.-Russia plan to keep Al-Assad in power leaked. Now, three minutes? No, more. <laughs> let, me skip, let me skip some stuff. Now, in February 2003, the Syrian biggest power generators facility, so the, the, uh, the uh, rebels start getting their hands on major uh, resources in Syria. So the United States is now they're getting their plans. They want to get actually in touch with the, with, the, with the rebels. They want to get in control with the rebels. So they want to create their summer lives there. And what they wanted to do, they want to start arming some of the groups and arming these groups, these groups has to be secular, has to be secular groups. These groups has not, should not be calling for Islam, should be just calling for democracy. And they are secular. In order to, in order to oppose and go against the Islamic groups or the, the, groups, the, the groups that are uh, the winning groups or the groups that have the power actually in Syria. So they are start attracting some of these weaker groups. Remember in Syria, in the Syria, and this is, there, is, there is no law now, there is no order. So in every village, in every city, you will have 100 people coming together and they're creating a group. You don't know who they are. So it's an opportunity to go and get these and support them with the weapons. They need weapons. To get rid of Bashar, they need weapons. So support them with weapons, but put your own conditions on them. This way, they will be the ones who are winning and this way, you will, we, you will, the other groups that are actually calling for establishment of Islam will be weakened. So that's the, what the United States and the world is trying to do. Then the, in March 2013, the Syrian transitional government was established by, uh, and uh, its uh, leader is Ghassan Hito. He's, a from, he's an IT CEO from Texas. And uh, the main reason is to keep Bashar al-Assad in power until 2014. That's where his time ends, and then there will be elections. So they want to prolong that until 2014, so there will be a transition.
uh, smooth transition in the government. That's the plan. These are some of the Friday's names that actually shows, you know, with the Arab Revolution, the tradition became like every Friday you will have a name for that Friday. And the purpose of this is actually to show some of the, how the people, the Syrian people, the leaders of this revolution from inside, they are actually politically aware of what's going on in the world, outside and the planning uh, for Syria. Now, from a world perspective, we covered the US and Russia. Britain and France, they are on the side. They don't have, they don't have any, any influence inside Syria, but they will ride the wave in order to get any influence. So whatever the US decides, they will follow. Uh, Iran is supporting the, 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 the regime directly with, with weapons and everything. Turkey is playing a role, we'll discuss it later. Qatar is just a facilitator. You know, the US and the, uh, uh, the US decides that we have to meet, we have to gather. Where we go? We go to Qatar. We'll go there and we'll discuss there. So it's just hosting of events. Jordan, Jordan as the king mentioned lately, uh, he mentioned that his job is actually to stop the rise of Islam in the area. It's in an interview. Uh, Saudi Arabia, it's the same thing. It's going with the, with the same plan. They don't like to see the revolution in Syria succeed, succeed in the path that it's going on right now. The US, it has a double standard where the invasion in Libya was justified on the bloodbath that was going to take place in Benghazi. And that's what Obama said in order to justify the invasion of, the, of uh, Libya. What he said, some nations may be able to turn a blind eye to atrocities in other countries. The United States of America is different, and as a president, I refuse to wait for the images of slaughter and mass graves before taking action. But he saw many in Syria. Many, many in Syria. Two faces, U.S. has constantly stated its support to the opposition in Syria, but has acted as a barrier for them receiving weapons. Secretary of Defense Le uh, Leon Panetta in March 2012 said, it is not clear what constitutes the Syrian armed position. There has been no single unifying military alternative that can be recognized, appointed, or contacted. So they support the revolution, but they're not going to provide them with weapons. Weapons to the good guys, merely agents only. The U.S. Representative Mike Rogers told CNN, we, have, we are just not exactly sure who the bad guys are and who the good guys are right now in Syria, so you do not know who you are going to give weapons to. U.S. Russia, it's in complete sync. Yes, you, you will see Russia saying that it's, oppo it's opposing any intervention in Syria, but that's what the United States wants now until it finds an alternative for Bashar. Uh, Turkey, it's in complete sync. Just uh, quickly, this is what uh, Erdogan uh, stated about the relationship of Turkey with the United States. Today, Turkey is, is interested in most of the subjects in the world that the USA is interested in. We share a common vision in a very broad spectrum from Afghanistan to Iraq, Palestine, and Balkan. So that's their policy. Whatever the United States is interested in, that's their interest. Now, this revolution has one direction, which is the, it's direct toward the people are there are asking for the implementing the rules of Islam. They want to implement Islam. They want to revive the, Muslim, the Ummah. They want to revive the Muslims. But the other countries around are trying to redirect it. And they want to redirect it so the outcome to be the same as in Libya, the same as in Tunis, the same as in Egypt. So you need a Muslim leader, but without Islam. We don't want Islam to rule. We want a civil state, but we don't want an Islamic state. <coughs> and we will do that through coalitions, through the CNC, through the, the Sahwa-like groups that they use in Iraq in order to uh, fight, the, in order to, uh, to uh, or combat the other groups that were fighting the United States in Iraq. Let me skip this, Henry Kissinger. Now, means to do that is you need to create an internal conflict among the different groups through intelligent operations, which if you follow in the media, there are many intelligent operations that are actually happening, and or through material support to specific groups. Now, the Council of Foreign Relations puts this bluntly. It says, the only strategy that stands a chance and not even necessarily a very good one is for the United States, the post-Assad Alawites, and the secular Syrian Sunnis to focus relentlessly on the common goal, which is stopping the victory of Islamic extremists. Now, the Islamic perspective, so I'll do that, try to do that quickly. 
So the revolution goal, as we mentioned, it's revival of the Muslim Ummah. They want to revive the Muslims. And the revival means change based on the ideology of Islam. And you want to change what? You want to change the society itself. Because the society consists of ruling system, which is the government, individuals, humans living there. They have rules applied on them by the government, but that applies the rules on them. And there is a relationship between these people. Now, if I want to change anything, if I want to change the society, I have to change all of this. I have to change the individuals so become they're Muslims and they think in Islam. I have to change the rules that are applied to be Islamic rules. I have to change the, 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 the government so it will be an Islamic government that rules and applies Islamic rules. So that's the change in the society and that's what the revolution in Syria is trying to do. The change that the media is hiding is, now there is a media factor which is very important in the revolutions, uh, they're hiding anything that talks about Islam. That these revolutions are actually, and the, and the, and the groups there are actually asking for, are calling for Islam. So Islam is playing an important role in the uprising in Syria. Many defectors, you know, the defectors out of the Syrian army, they come and join the, Islam, the, the groups and they will say that they want to establish the Islamic, they want to establish an Islamic government. Numerous brigades, as well as individual units have openly stated and documented their wish to establish the Khilafah, which is the Islamic State, after the fall of Bashar al-Assad. You, you go and you can find many of these on YouTube. Yes, you don't see it on Al Jazeera, you don't see it on Arabiya or CNN, but if you follow the revolution, you will find many of that on uh, YouTube. So the direction, the revolution started with, you know, with uh, the Syrian flag at the time of the French, not even the current one, so they're, all, they're calling for their freedom, and all of a sudden change to, they want to call for the establishment of Islam. With time, they changed and start calling for Islam because they found after two years, this is the only way out. This is the only way out for them is establishing Islam. And on the ground, if you are following also, you will see that the peaceful revolution was brutally cracked down. And then the direction of the revolution, you will see it even through, through some of the Friday names that they give it to the Fridays. One is, مَلْنَ غَيْرَكَ يَا Allah. We have no supporter but Allah. لَنْ نَرْكَعْ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ We will not bow down but to Allah. نَصْرٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَفَتْحٌ قَرِيبٌ Victory is from Allah. إِنْ تَنْصُرُ اللَّهِ يَنْصُرْكُمْ If you provide victory to Allah, He will make you victorious. وَاثِقُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ We believe in Allah's victory. These are the names of Fridays which tells you something about that revolution. The unity of the Syrian people, so the, so the Syrian people within the two years, there are many incidents, many events that happened in the Muslim world. But they were not having just a closed eye on Syria and what's happening in Syria itself. No, they were looking at the whole world, what's going on. And the things that happened, Yemen. So they have the revolution in Yemen. They have a Friday that's called Victory to Our Sham and Yemen. In Burma, they have many, many uh, signs and many talks and many discussions just about the events that's happening in Burma, killing the Muslims in Burma. Mali, the intervention of France in Mali. They talked about it and they discussed it and they went against it. So Mali, France went there to Mali because of interest, but in Syria, they're not willing even to provide whoever, whoever wants military equipment, they're not, they're, not, they're not willing to provide it. So the internal revolution leaders are politically aware and at the same time connected with the Ummah at large. Now, is this change, which is the change to an Islamic system or Islamic government, is this a threat? Yes, for the oppressors only. If you, go, if you read the seer of the Prophet وسلم, you see who opposed him in, in, in Mecca. It was just the oppressors and the leaders. Same thing now. Islam is a mercy for everything. We have sent you just a mercy. So the, you know, the, the, the religion of Islam and the deen of Islam is a mercy. And it's only a mercy. And it will be only a threat to the oppressors who are actually benefiting from the current status quo. Now, future direction, I'll close with this. We have two paths. One long path where you don't know where you are ending. There is one path where you see there is a light there. That's the path of the, what the Muslim governments and the rest of the world wants. This is the path that the Muslims minus the governments wants. What the Muslim wants. And the Prophet وسلم, talks about a sham. A sham is a special. There are hadiths that talk about a sham. I encourage you to go and read and search for this hadith. 
Prophet ﷺ said, how blessed is Sham? The companions around asked, why is that? The Messenger ﷺ replied, I see the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spreading their wings over Sham. Concluding with this ayah from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات ليستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم وليمكنن لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم وليبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونني لا يشركون بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فأولئك هم الفاسقون الله has promised such of you who believe and do good deeds that he will surely make them to succeed the present rulers in the earth even as he caused those before you to succeed others and he will surely establish for them their religion which he has approved for them and will give in exchange safety after their fear. Wassalamu alaikum jazakum wa khair. Sorry for... Sorry. I have to finish it. Jazakallah khair. Takbir. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar.